I hope you can see that okay. Assuming that you can, um, and please shout if you can't. Yes, I'm going to give you some numbers. Uh, and these numbers are not years uh, for human survival. They are indeed months. Because the current data would suggest that this is the number of months we have left without radical action. Uh, if we are going to allow life on Earth to be sustained as anything more than a Permian level mass extinction. That's the end of the century. The 360 months is probably the time we have left for human civilization as we know it without the radical action. And the 87 months is the time left we have to avert both of those catastrophes. So this is your mortality in months, not those of your grandchildren. Uh, Day Mann was involved in this report, as was Anthony uh, Costello on this call today. Uh, in 2008-9, we said that climate change was the greatest threat to global health of the 21st century. And we were wrong because it wasn't about just about health. It was about our survival. And it wasn't an issue of just this century. It's now measured in the next 30 years. Because this in 2019 was what humanity was burning in the way of fossil fuels. By last year, that had gone up by another 5.9%, and it will have gone up again this year, releasing huge quantities of greenhouse gas, which trap vast amounts of long-wave radiation to heat our globe. And we've trapped somewhere approaching 50 billion Hiroshima bombs worth of energy in our oceans and low atmosphere since 1998 alone. And we continue to trap five Hiroshima bombs worth of energy every second even now. Even if we were to stop emitting CO2, we would still be trapping uh, around a fifth of that amount in 33,000 years from now, and 7% of that in 100,000 years time. So things don't stop just because we do. This is driving up global temperatures, melting Arctic sea ice, causing the collapse of land-based ice, the Greenland ice shelf now losing 1 million metric tons a minute, and that with thermal ocean expansion, causing those oceans sea levels to rise now about a centimetre every two years. If you add energy to an atmosphere, you get extreme weather events, and the more energy you add, the more extreme events you'll get, and the more extreme there will be. And as this map shows you, the very vast majority of extreme weather events of the last decade are now statistically attributable to climate change. And you're familiar with them. This was the fire in Australia in the winter just prior to COVID, our Northern Hemisphere winter. Rem worth remembering that just that fire in just the east of just one province of just one continent in just one season, added nearly two and a half percent to global greenhouse gas emissions on its own, the first of the feedback loops of which we'll be speaking shortly. But Siberia was ablaze that year. California is increasingly ablaze, as is the Amazon, three times as many fires in Angola and the Congo, Indonesia, Canada, you will remember the fires last year, as well as across mainland Europe. But it didn't stop last year. This was January, South American record temperatures, Australian record temperatures, Spanish record temperatures, and indeed in Pakistan, where the joke earlier this year was that if you go to hell, you'd better take a blanket because it was cooler there than it was in Pakistan. That was Austria heralding this massive heat wave throughout Europe in June, whilst Japan, China and Korea de were dealing with the same heat wave, as was North America, followed by us with our record temperatures in uh, July of this year. Worth remembering that a paper only two years ago gave us around a 33% chance of breaching 41 degrees within 30 years, and we did it within two. This was the Rhine, down to 36 centimetres of depth in Cobe. This was the Po River drying up, causing agriculture in 22% of Italian agriculture to fail. This was Lake Mead in California doing the same. Remember, though, that there were the floods on the Belgian border. This was Germany last year and China in the same month, August of last year. This was New York, British Columbia at the end of last year, Malaysia at the end of last year, and so forth. These are ongoing. Valencia in Spain, highest density rainfall ever recorded. Australia um, earlier this year. And remember, of course, that over a third of Pakistan is currently underwater at the moment. Pointing out that one and a bit degrees is clearly unsafe. Um, and talk of degrees makes me a bit angry because it's hard to quantify how much energy it takes to raise the surface temperature of an entire planet by one and a bit degrees. And it's that energy gain that's our problem. 
The problem is, though, that our current trajectory takes us to approaching five and a half degrees this century. And we already know that one and a bit degrees is not safe and that that heating will continue for the reasons which I've explained. Even if we draw down in, uh, carbon dioxide now and stop emitting, we're therefore locked into progressive climate change for thousands of years. So that's the first part. The 360 is the months left for us to act because we thought for too long that this is a problem for our grandchildren. Look at what the IPCC said at the last year, end of last year. Species extinction, widespread disease, unlivable heat, ecosystem collapse and cities menaced by rising seas will become painfully obvious before a child born today turns 30. This is in the life expectancy of many of you listening to this talk today, and certainly in that of your family and children. 18% of the world's surface area currently occupied by humans we know will be uninhabitable within 30 to 50 years as a minimum, leading to the death or displacement of 3 billion people, to which we can add nearly two thirds of a billion who will be under the high tide mark. That's half of the entire world's population dead or migrating within 30 to 50 years, even if things don't progress too quickly, but they will. You'll notice in the short uh, abstract I put together for this talk, I talked about there being seven feedback loops we've triggered. Even since I submitted that, we're now up to 10. The first is the fires, which I've spoken. Dry air draws moisture from soil. High temperatures make fires more likely, releasing CO2, as I described for Australia. But as we melt ice and snow, you expose dark soil and ocean to absorb heat. And this effect has doubled the rate of Earth's energy gain in just the last 14 years. We're releasing methane from carbonate rocks and from melting tundra and from uh, methane hydrates there and from fermenting wetlands. Methane being 83 times as powerful a greenhouse gas in its first 20 years as is carbon dioxide. And all of these are in a feeding frenzy. They're not feedback loops operating independently of one another. They're all interacting. On top of that, the carbon monoxide from fires mops up hydroxyl radicals, which would normally uh, strip out the methane from the atmosphere, extending its half-life. The Australian fires themselves provided an insulating blanket to further dry up temperatures. In fact, we now know they drove up Australian temperatures by three degrees Celsius, whilst the black soot going to the atmosphere absorb heat in the lower stratosphere raising lower stratospheric temperatures by another 0.7 degrees Celsius from just that fire, whilst it also punched a hole in the Antarctic ozone, which expanded as a consequence. Meanwhile, we strip out Amazon rainforest, which is now becoming so dry that it burns, and all the rainforests in the world are now net CO2 emitters. It's worse than this, though, because we are facing binary changes in state of climate as we go forward. These events are known as Danskard Oeschler events, and they are rapid warming at the poles. The Arctic and Antarctic are already warming at three times the rate of the global surface average. And you can see one representative sudden event there at 38,000 years ago, when temperatures rose by around 10 to 12 degrees at the poles in the space of only a decade or so. To the right of the screen, and that's blocked on mine, but you may be able to see it, um, is the prediction for today, suggesting that we've triggered a DO event that will cause uh, polar temperatures rise by around 35 degrees Celsius in coming decades. This paper was published two years ago before we realized that this was indeed true, because on March the 21st of this year, Antarctic temperatures were 40 Celsius above normal, and those in the North Pole were 30 Celsius above normal. A day later, Antarctic temperatures were 47 Celsius above normal. Indeed, in June of this year, the Arctic Circle average temperature was 32.5 Celsius compared to an average of 13 degrees Celsius. And this will cause very, very rapid collapse of the land-based ice sheets and very sudden acceleration in sea level. The Thwaites Glacier, for instance, is already losing around 1.6 million litres of water a second, and the terminal pillars of ice, which anchor it to the continental shelf, are now shattering and fracturing. There will be nothing to hold that glacier back from sliding into the ocean on meltwater, causing sudden acceleration in sea level rise. And indeed, even from this month alone, we now know that we've got record melt um, in 
uh, of meltwater in September in Greenland, that sharp right line being an unheralded in historical uh, data, 27 Celsius above normal, melt across around 35% of that Antarctic ice sheet. And that on its own in one day released that many uh, liters of water in melt in just one day. 20 billions of tons of ice melted that one weekend, 7% of what would be a normal annual total. The Atlantic Meridial Overturn circulation draws in warm water from the Pacific to the right up past our coast to the left as the Gulf Stream, and a collapse of that would be catastrophic to the world's climate. The problem is that we now know we're at a point close to critical transition, with both of these papers below suggesting, yet again, that we are likely to see this happening within the next 30 years, meaning that Spain essentially uh, will become uh, arid and that we will face uh, winter temperatures much like those of Newfoundland. The jet stream is also likely to have flipped north in the same sort of time frame, depriving the whole of the Iberian Peninsula of, of water and dumping that water in northern Europe as rain, or if the MOC switches off at the same time, in tens of metres of winter snow. At the same time, we're seeing the splitting of the jet stream in the summer months, as we saw this year, trapping um, the heat domes that we saw throughout the summer months, creating this uh, massive heat effect across the Atlantic and across Europe. And it's not just the scientists and economists are saying this, it's the military. Even in 2003, the Pentagon warning that climate change could cause a significant drop in the human carrying capacity of the Earth's environment. They're talking about billions of people dying. Finally, the number of 939 because it isn't just human life that is threatened, it's that of our entire ecosystem. And we know that the rising temperatures of the oceans with their acidification threatens our entire biosphere. This paper in Science earlier this year, suggesting that without urgent change, we will see a mass extinction cult, um, similar to that that we saw with the Permian uh, uh, locked in by the end of the century. That's 96% of life on earth extinct. And what are we doing? Not much. This is the exponential rise in atmospheric CO, uh, greenhouse gas emissions. These are the COP negotiations. And you'll see they've done absolutely nothing to influence that rise. Even if everything that was put on the table in Glasgow was enacted, and it's never been before, we're still going to get a further rise of 14% by 2030. We will punch through one and a half degrees in somewhere between four and 10 years. They promised to end deforestation, but Bolsonaro changed that to illegal deforestation and then legalized it so he could chop all the trees down. And we've now got a doubling of the rate of Amazonian deforestation even since last November as a consequence. They said they would cut methane emissions, but we found that they're now going up. And of course, we've got the changes in legislation in America preventing the Environment Protection Agency from legislating against CO2. So you have 87 months left. If you think one and a half degrees is safe, to have solved the problem. And this is where I shall end because I wanted to use this time to sound the alarm because to stay below one and a half degrees, we need to have got a reduction of 45% in emissions across everything we do in the entire globe within seven years. And if we fail to, as the IPCC said, we miss a brief and rapidly closing window to secure a livable future. That's one where you, or your children have a chance of living. Healthcare can do it alone. We're 5% of global greenhouse gas emissions, but we're 12% of global domestic product, and we intersect with at least 70% of global supply chains. If we decarbonize our health systems aggressively and quickly, and bear in mind we have months left to do this in, there is a chance we could tilt the world economy, the section we have control over. And that's where I shall end on a high note because we are in for certain catastrophe now, um, but I think it's our responsibility uh, to be the heroes of the peace, not the villains. Thank you very much for listening.